If you want to see an extended, entirely ad-free version of this video, I want to remind you about our wonderful members-only community, The Society at TFD, available here on YouTube or over on Patreon. The membership is exactly the same on both platforms, so you can join through whichever platform you prefer. If you want to support us here at TFD, joining our members-only community is the best way to do that. Members get early access to the ad-free extended director's cut of this video you're about to watch, as well as access to 20-plus ad-free bonus videos, monthly workshops, our Discord community, our book club, and more when you join. Again, you can join here on YouTube, or you can join on patreon.com slash financial diet and join at the $4.99 level. As many of you know, we are a completely independent women-owned and run small business, and our 2024 goal is to become primarily supported by our incredible community. We love you guys, whether or not you join the society, but it'd be a lot cooler if you did. Hey guys, it's Chelsea, and this is The Financial Diet. And today I'm gonna do something that I honestly didn't think I'd ever do when I started this channel in my 20s. At the time, it was sort of the peak era of millennial shaming, talking about how we were so lazy and all we wanted was our avocado toast and to murder chain restaurants. Especially working in personal finance, it felt like every day was a new opportunity for the generations above us to nitpick every single aspect of our finances and find limitless ways to tell us that our economic problems were our fault. It felt cringy and tone deaf and quite frankly, extremely frustrating. So you can imagine my surprise when years later at the ripe old age of 35, I'm ready to have a conversation about the generation below me. Now I wanna say up front here that this is not about Gen Z shaming. Some of my best friends are Gen Z. Just kidding, but I do like some of them. But all of today's interview guests are going to be Gen Z themselves, so your community will be represented. And more importantly, this isn't about explaining why the very real economic and social problems that Gen Z are facing is actually their fault. This is about understanding the situation that we're in and acknowledging that while Gen Z may be on the cutting edge of some of these serious problems, none of us are spared from the effects of the way the world seems to be going economically. In some ways we can describe it by saying it is the best of times and it is the worst of times. The best in that you can open up your phone and at a moment's notice access basically any piece of information that's ever existed, order from any restaurant in a 30 mile radius, watch any television show or movie your heart desires, and instantly connect with people you love or people you hate across the world. But it's the worst in that basically all financial and lifestyle foundations on which previous generations had built their stability and let's be honest, their sanity, have been eroding underneath our feet as that aforementioned convenience only explodes. Most of us are familiar with the concept of millennials being the first generation to do worse than their parents. And while this is a fairly controversial statement when you actually look at the data, there is some undeniable evidence that millennials are lagging behind in unique ways. What's worth noting is that especially as millennials move into their 30s and beyond, some of the off-sited gaps, income, homeownership, etc., are closing compared to previous generations, but that this varies widely by things like race or education level. What's undeniable though, even if the millennial situation is improving, is that we had an extremely rocky young adulthood economically. We graduated into a recession, saddled with unprecedented levels of debt, and facing the one-two punch of stagnant wages and rising cost of living. Unfortunately, Gen Z is already showing showing some signs of doing even worse. So we'll get into the economics, but just at a glance when it comes to how Gen Z is feeling, only 41% of Gen Z members aged 18 to 26 describe themselves as thriving, according to one study, while millennials at the same age were thriving at a rate of about 60%. Researchers also said they found, quote, evidence that Gen Z's self-reported mental health struggles are distinct from those of previous generations at the same age. Asked to describe their current mental health or well-being, only 15% of members of Gen Z aged 18 to 
26 said it was excellent. That's a steep drop compared to a decade ago, the study found, when 52% of millennials in that same age range said that their mental health was excellent. And in 2004, 55% of people aged 18 to 26, including both millennials and Gen X respondents, reported excellent mental health. It also can't be stated when looking at how Gen Z views their long-term future and finances, how much the potential impacts of climate change impact even an ability to envision a future, let alone a prosperous one. We're not gonna get too into unpacking climate stuff in this particular video, although we will in a future essay, but it can't be understated how much of this shorter term thinking is influenced by a very real inability in predicting what a long-term future looks like. After all, what's the point of girl bossing if we're all gonna be underwater in 50 years? Why is it Aquaman and not Aquawoman, I say? In some ways though, the entire framing of doing worse than our parents is becoming less and less relevant with time, both because fewer and fewer young people are having children, and we'll unpack that in a future video essay, but because there's always a dodge for assessing the very real metric of prosperity. Put simply, as I mentioned in my somewhat sarcastic intro, people can point, and they often do, to the fact that even though millennials and Gen Z might be suffering financially, they have a higher standard of living. Here's how one recent article put it. Most people would say, given the lack of earnings growth, that it doesn't look as good for the younger generation, said Catherine Edwards, an economist at the Rand Corporation. Others would come back and say that there have been increases in the standard of living. Edwards believes that any generation could make a compelling case for themselves having it the hardest. Here's why. Overall, Edwards argues that young people tend to take certain amenities for granted. For example, she says that in order to listen to a new album by their favorite musician, their parents had to spend a significant amount on a stereo system and buy a physical album in an actual store. The same can be said of other electronics like cameras and camcorders, TVs, movies, and countless other conveniences that were once pretty pricey, and now come packed into a $1,000 smartphone or via a relatively low-cost streaming subscription. And this isn't just, in my opinion, a very faulty perception of what quality of life actually means, because having an increasing number of conveniences does not cancel out lacking basic stability, it's a dangerous precedent for what is increasingly becoming everyone's economic reality, a gilded fantasy sitting atop an increasingly unlivable real world. In some ways, Gen Z has more superficial comfort than even the wealthiest royalty of just a few generations ago. But not only is it not a replacement for actual wealth, this overabundance of information, of access, of cheap goods, of exposure to other people's lives, heavily contributes to that same erosion of mental health that we just mentioned. Which brings us to chapter one, the facade of wealth without the finances. Before we dive into the many, many examples of how Zoomers buy everything and own nothing, I'd like to give a little bit of macro perspective on the situation that we're dealing with here. Because Zoomers are facing a uniquely difficult financial contradiction. They're able to buy things more quickly and painlessly than any previous generation, thanks to smartphones, store apps, and buying directly through social media. They can put off paying in full for almost any consumer product, thanks to buy now, pay later services. And things like clothing and travel are cheaper than they've ever been. Yet at the same time, buying a home and financing an education, the things that the boomer generation say are necessary for a financially successful life, are more out of reach than they've ever been, and Gen Zers are facing more debt than previous generations. We have to remember that the oldest Gen Zers were entering adulthood during the peak of the COVID pandemic, even though their financial outlook was surely already taking shape before 2020, things like the pandemic era bloating of housing costs have hugely impacted their and all of our reality. To talk about the economic realities Gen Z is facing, we talked with Dot Soller, a PhD candidate in American politics at the University of Rochester, who, like everyone else we've interviewed for this video, is herself Gen Z. So I think the situation that Gen Z is in, in particular, that is unique to them, is that coming into their adulthood, so at their sort of late teens, they were really primed to inherit like a rocket economy. Um, unemployment was really low, housing prices were relatively stable, like things looked really good. And then the pandemic hit and all of that changed really dramatically as they became adults. Not only were sort of their formative adult years and the kinds of consumption behaviors, the kinds of job training, um, the kinds of jobs even that they might have entered were completely taken off the table, but now that we've sort of returned to leaving the house again, even though some economic indicators right now look, you know, particularly optimistic, right? Like the Fed has been reticent to raise rates. Um, it's possible that home prices start to come down soon. 
that's not translating into lower prices at the grocery store or lower rents or immediately accessible housing options. And so to my mind, Gen Z sort of had a preview of this wonderful adulthood ahead of them that was kind of snatched out of their hands, especially those who started a job training program or a master's degree or a college program or like myself began their PhD during the year the pandemic hit. They might have sunk a lot of cost and a lot of effort into these kinds of programs only to find that the the sort of post-lockdown world is very different than the one they left behind, and that investment is not going to pay off in the way that they anticipated. Just a few important numbers. For home buying, according to financial analytics from firm S&P Global, in 29 states led by Hawaii, California, and the District of Columbia, the median household cannot afford a median-priced home, according to our Home Affordability Index. And the outlook isn't really improving, even with lower interest rates on the horizon. According to S&P Global, in the near term, we do not expect a big correction in affordability. Home prices will keep moving higher in all regions owing to constrained supplies of existing homes. Declining mortgage rates, not expected to begin in earnest until late 2024 and 2025, will provide affordability relief past the near term. Lower rates will enable lock-in homeowners to list their homes and move into a new dwelling, in turn helping to improve inventories of existing homes on the market. This housing market relief will not translate into a full reversal of current affordability trends. We expect rising prices to dampen any rebound in affordability coming from lower borrowing costs. And home buying is either less important to Gen Z than previous generations, or they've just come to accept that it's just not in the cards. Quote, 63% of Gen Z respondents to Bank Rates Financial Security Survey associated owning a home with the American dream, less than the overall 73%. Then there's student loans. Many Gen Zers faced their first student loans last fall, when federal student loan payments finally resumed post-pandemic, and it's already affecting how they manage to afford their lives. According to a poll from Credit Karma, 32% of Gen Z Americans, those ages 18 to 26 with student debt, says they won't be able to afford to travel home for the holidays on top of their payments. And the cost of education has continued to rise exponentially. After adjusting for currency inflation, college tuition has increased 747.8% since 1963. And it doesn't seem to be stopping. Even affordable higher education systems are inflating the cost of tuition, such as the Cal State system, which announced plans to increase tuition costs 34% over the next five years. Then they're saving and spending. So while Gen Z, like millennials before them, are not just throwing away all of their money instead of saving, but when they do save for the long term, they're kind of being set up to fail. Quote, two thirds of young adults are saving for retirement in a 401k or similar plan, contributing 20% of their pay at the median, a rate double that of working Americans overall. But there are indications that these gains are being eroded, particularly as wage increases slow and the student loan payment pause comes to an end. Experts worry about the high rate at which young adults are tapping into retirement savings. Schwab ran a study recently among its 401k holders and found that the average desired retirement age for Gen Z is 61, um, whereas the desired retirement ages for all other generations are 65 or higher. Um, but 99% of the Gen Zers they surveyed said that they feel they face large obstacles to saving for a comfortable retirement. Um, that's up from 9% of Gen Zers surveyed last year, and it's also higher than the number of millennials, um, who said about 88% said they felt like they faced really like strong obstacles for um, saving for retirement. So I don't wanna try to stretch those data where they don't go, because this is a survey of about 1,000 401k holders um, just with Charles Schwab. So this isn't telling the story of people working in industries and working in jobs who don't have 401k savings. But insofar as we can like sort of stretch the general intuition of these data, I think that you know you're seeing like we're seeing a workforce that isn't particularly confident in its ability to retire, um, that has very low trust in both the private and public or like government institutions in place that in theory should sort of keep them safe and keep them economically secure. And their response to that is a desire to get out of these systems faster, to retire earlier. Um, 
but have much less confidence in their actual practical ability to do so. And perhaps as a result of this disconnect between what Gen Z is being paid and how much their lives cost, they're also racking up debt at a higher rate than previous generations. Quote, Gen Z is racking up more credit card debt than previous generations, while Gen X holds the highest average credit card debt, according to recent data from Credit Karma. Between April and June 2023, Gen Z had an average credit card balance of $3,328, a 4.23 increase from January to March of that same year. In preparing for this video and looking at the data, we knew that we wanted to talk to specifically a Gen Zer who themselves has struggled heavily with credit card debt. So we sat down to talk with Brittany Reynolds, a young woman who's been very open on social media about her journey to pay off $36,000 in credit card debt, and also someone with whom I sat down for a full episode of The Financial Confession for next season. At the highest, my credit card debt was 36227 uh, I believe was the exact number. Um, and now it is at 12500 So we've paid off quite a bit. Um, but yeah, it was a lot of overconsumption. It was buying things and just immediately putting them on my card. Um, and then I would pay too much on my credit cards and I wouldn't have money in my checking and then I would have to get my groceries on my on my credit card so it was such a such a downward spiral really of just overspending 10 most sold Amazon products answering questions about the lamp in my shower Amazon bathroom must-haves Amazon home finds I've slept on this Amazon find for way too long six word things on Amazon I actually like 10 Amazon home finds I use every day tiny purchases I made that were inexpensive but worth the money this is from Amazon Amazon products you need part 203 Amazon favorites let's do a top 10 items from Amazon I can't live without TikTok made me buy this part five. Now, with the not great economic situation that Gen Z is facing, and the feeling that even if they do attempt long-term financial planning, they might be sabotaged in their efforts, it's not surprising that Gen Z is leaning into the conveniences afforded by our culture of instant gratification. In fact, I would go so far as to say, chapter two, Gen Z, the instant gratification generation. The internet age has brought about such a big culture shift that we now can't imagine going back to a life without it. However, those of us who grew up before the age of app culture can at least remember life without rideshare apps, same day delivery, and even just having a smartphone to occupy your time when you're waiting in a long checkout line. Back in my day, we had to go to the store and get a CD of the music we wanted to listen to, and if we just had that CD, that's just the music you listen to. And if you didn't like that CD, if it turned out to be a bit of a flop, Oh well, hope you like that until the next time your parents will take you to Sam Goody. In fact, fun fact, um, we did a thing where we would burn like between 10 and 20 songs onto a single CD to make a mixtape. And yes, people did this prior to the advent of LimeWire and all the chaos that that created for our parents' home computers via recording from the radio directly onto cassette tapes. I've heard tell that was a thing before my generation. But anyway, we did the um, mixtape CDs and I have such a strong association with certain mixed CDs that I had um, for songs and the order in which they were played on that CD that even to this day when I hear certain ones of those songs, I'm like, wait, that should go into X song. Like the other day I listened to Move Your Feet by Junior Senior. And in my mind, I was like, well, the next song is London Calling by The Clash because I had those two songs back to back on an extremely dissonant mix CD that a guy I like made for me. And I listened to that until literally the CD stopped working. So it's just a little insight into our pre-smartphone era. For much of Gen Z, however, smartphone and app dependent living is the norm that they were brought up on. They were iPad kids before we even knew to worry about iPad kids. And they got to listen to whatever music they wanted in whatever order they wanted, the luxury. They have simply grown up online with instant access to everything, buying Amazon Prime with one click, using pay-to-play apps and in-app purchases to instantly upgrade their gaming experience, and never far away from, if not their own smartphone or iPad, at least their parents. And as this spills over into public life, we've really only just scratched the surface of things like the iPad and restaurant phenomenon, because when iPads came onto the market in 2010, Gen Z was comprised of kids ranging from not yet born to preteens. Quote, parents immediately began giving iPads to their children with intentions of using these devices as distractions or entertainment. A 2011 study found that 39% of two to four-year-olds have direct access to digital media just a year after the iPad's inception. More intelligent people than myself 
have made this observation before, but I'm gonna reiterate it. I really do think that the unbridled use of tech with small children is one day gonna be looked back at as like a doctor blasting a cigarette uh, while giving someone a physical, just like this thing that we were all doing, uh, not realizing the profound damage it was doing to our bodies. Digression, but I really do believe that. And this trend is even more apparent for Gen Alpha. It's now far more likely for a child or young adult to be online than offline. One study from 2017 found that 80% of children age zero to eight have access to a smartphone or tablet. And the desire for instant gratification is a vicious cycle of consumerism. Corporations tell consumers that they can expect to get what they want when they want. So consumers then come to expect to get what they want when they want it, and corporations find themselves in an arm race to provide even more convenience. For instance, Gen Zers order much more food delivery. According to a 2023 report from DoorDash, quote, 47% of Gen Zers in the US and 39% of millennials are ordering more delivery than last year, compared to only 26% of Gen X and baby boomers. Gen Zers are also a lot more likely to use quick delivery services like Amazon Prime. According to Amazon's own statistics, quote, compared to other generations, 47% of Gen Z use the platform, followed by 35% of millennials and 28% of Gen X. I, I think one of the major challenges, right, is that like attempting to address the climate problem is necessarily a coordination problem. It requires that sort of all of us together sink effort into achieving this long-term payoff. Rather than besmirch the good name of Gen Z farther and talk about instant gratification, I, I think I will invite us to think about Gen Z as rather a risk averse generation. This is a generation that expresses incredible cynicism about the future. Um, so conditional on those beliefs, on the belief that why would I take a good payoff tomorrow when I don't know if we'll all be here tomorrow? It makes complete sense to me that we would see folks deviating and taking a high payoff today. Now you could describe this preference for instant gratification as a form of entitlement. And I'm sure Dave Ramsey is somewhere doing just that right now. But it's ultimately not even very self-serving. It's actually making life worse for Gen Z and others while only really serving the interest of corporate profit. Gen Z and millennials both have shorter attention spans than previous generations. Quote, according to current research, the typical person has an attention span of 8.25 seconds, which is 4.25 seconds shorter than in 2000. Scientists confirm that goldfish have longer attention spans than humans, which is recorded at nine seconds. Massive L for the human species. And today's young people are some of the loneliest, which we've discussed in a lot of previous videos. We're in a loneliness epidemic that is a genuine public health emergency. Quote, over a third of Americans aged 18 to 25 reported feeling lonely frequently, almost all the time or all the time in the 30 days preceding a December 2022 survey conducted by the Harvard Graduate School of Education. Loneliness isn't only a mental health concern. Social isolation can be as dangerous as smoking up to 15 cigarettes a day and contributes to health issues, including cardiovascular disease, stroke, and dementia. So what I'm taking from this is that as someone who does have a fairly robust social life, I'm going to start smoking 14 cigarettes a day. But jokes aside, this constant convenience is also costing them more. Business Insider interviewed 23 Gen Zers on the subject of loneliness, and 20 of them said, quote, they're spending more money now than they were before the pandemic on social activities, such as art classes and gym memberships in order to make friends. Now, I should say that even though the numbers are more jarring for Gen Z, they are far from being the only generation who has become accustomed to the solution of every possible problem existing at their fingertips, no matter what actual cost it might come at because we are all constantly being conditioned to this culture of convenience at the sacrifice of things like quality, sustainability, or affordability. A result of the appification of our lives is also the extent to which companies can surveil us and use our own habits against us, or at least as a way to extract more money from us. In the members only director's cut of this video, which you can access by hitting the join button at the link below, I go into a little mini digression on this topic. There's also plenty of other director's cut only content in this and every video essay, but I highly recommend checking out this one. If other generations though have at least the vague memory of a life before all of this constant convenience 
and technology. Gen Z makes sense as some of the least resistant to it when it's all they've realistically ever known, at least for the past decade plus. I spoke with recent TFC guest and stylist Heather Hurst, aka Pig Mommy, to talk about our relationship with consumption and why Gen Z in particular finds themselves in a strange place. I think that Gen Z has a weird relationship with wealth where things that we think are normal are actually still hyper wealthy, like tech bro culture or Laura Piana or these more casual displays of wealth. Like, oh, they're just wearing humble denim cutoffs and flip flops, but they're like on a boat in Positano. Like, I think that because we think of that as being so casual and accessible and not flashy, so it doesn't feel distasteful, it's that's what's causing this like weird or that not causing, but that's what's in part layered into this weird relationship with wealth where there's like a disgust for traditional displays of wealth like being able to afford a brownstone and real estate and these things that feel glamorous or like a Birkin bag. But then we don't think it's distasteful if we're seeing somebody who's sort of like humbly with a chic, they could be carrying one of those netted bags that just look like a grocery bag, but it's actually like $700 from some bespoke designer and they just got a blowout and they're running around a cobblestone sidewalk in Mallorca or something. But because it has the appearances of looking more like organic and humble, we don't think of it as distasteful. And I think that a lot of that also has to do with social media where it's like we... I think we perceive wealth differently than we used to. And there's signifiers that are less overt that we're internalizing and then not admitting that those are still displays of wealth. And probably no single industry is a better example of the meeting of instant gratification and enormous cost to our own planet and mental health, quite like the fast fashion industry. Which brings us to chapter three, real-time retail, making 2000s fast fashion look quaint. So fast fashion and now real-time retail is a perfect example of just how much the entire consumer model has changed to respond to this totally fabricated need for instant gratification. With the rise of businesses like Shein, fast fashion as a term doesn't even really convey the scope to which retail has grown in terms of output, consumption, and waste. She in home montage, she in home montage. We're in the seventh circle of hell. We did an entire video on Shein specifically back in 2022, where we shared just how much the company is producing compared to other fast fashion brands like Forever 21 or H&M. The scale is so insane that marketers started calling companies like Shein real-time retail, as these sites list hundreds to thousands of new products every single day, compared to just the weekly drops that fast fashion brands were already putting out. Rookie number Numbers fast fashion. We are not destroying the planet fast enough, guys. Pick up the pace. First of all, I think the trend cycle, the way that we internalize trends now through organic content versus traditional print media. I think that in traditional print media landscapes, we used to be more aware of the fact that trends were manufactured by designers and corporations and passed down to us through advertising. But now with the rise of organic content, it feels like it's more quote unquote authentic or accessible and real, even though all of these trends and things are still shaped by rapid consumer cycles, but it's kind of giving the image that it's like peer to peer. So things turn over more quickly, which I think makes people feel like it's normal to assume these identities through clothing. Whereas we used to either not have access to do that as quickly through trend cycles, or we just maybe had more cynicism around trends because we felt like, oh, well, that's from the big flashy magazine. That's not what Beth down the street is doing, but I think the optics of TikTok and Instagram with like organic and authentic content can make it feel like it's normal to assume identities via clothing. So then that's alluring to people because it feels like something your peers are doing and not something that is like a push from corporations. And Shein's business practices are completely unsustainable, both from an environmental standpoint, but also from a human one. As I mentioned, the impact of this constant cycle of hyper-consumerism is not great for mental health, especially for younger generations who are exposed to it more frequently than almost anyone else, in part because it creates a constant sense of urgency and need that keeps them hooked into buying things they otherwise wouldn't have wanted. And when it comes to Shein's workforce, they are systematically underpaid, overworked, and even unsafe. Quote, advocacy groups and journalists also uncovered evidence that Shein's $11 bikinis and $7 crop tops were being made by people working in unsafe workshops, lacking in safety protocols like windows and emergency exits, and many also worked without contracts or minimum wage requirements, thereby allowing the company to reportedly fail to pay its employees properly. Channel 4's documentary Inside the Shein Machine sent undercover cameras to film factory 
workers who were forced to pull 17-hour shifts to make hundreds of garments a day. In one factory, they made a daily base salary of $20, which would then be docked by $14 if any garments had mistakes. And the environmental impact is shocking too. Quote, she and CEO Molly Miao has stated that each item is produced only in small numbers, between 50 to 100 pieces a day, before it becomes popular and is then mass produced. But the manufacturer's rapid use of virgin polyester and large consumption of oil churns out the same amount of CO2 as approximately 180 coal-fired power plants, according to Synthetics Anonymous 2.0, a report published on fashion sustainability. As a result, the company leaves about 6.3 million tons of carbon dioxide a year in its trail, a number that falls well below the 45% target to reduce global carbon emissions by 2030, which the UN has said is necessary for fashion companies to implement to help limit global warming. In potentially good news, however, there has been speculation recently about Shein's hopes for an IPO falling apart thanks to concerns over textile pollution, as being an unsustainable brand these days makes a company an IPO risk. And more and more influencers have started to distance themselves from Shein over their unsustainable practices and worker conditions. But it's worth asking ourselves why a company like this was able to get so popular in the first place. Now, beyond just how incredibly cheap the product is, therefore making it accessible to almost literally everyone, it can't be understated how much Shein became the force it is specifically because of its social media strategy. Those dystopian Shein hauls we looked at at the beginning of this chapter are just the tip of the iceberg for how innovative, and I mean that in a negative sense, the brand has been about its social media presence. Quote, the center of the marketing strategy is its use of influencers and their hashtag Shein Hall videos. The company has partnered with countless micro celebrities, fashion bloggers, and reality show contestants to show off their Shein deliveries. The company was reportedly working with about 2,000 Indian influencers alone before the Indian government banned the app in 2020 as a retaliatory move against China. These Shein Hall videos are helping sell the products, but they're also a very clear iteration of the relationship Gen Zers have with retail. The expectation that they should get as much as they want when they want it for as little money as possible. And it's a completely understandable position for Gen Z to value instant access and affordability above all else, and to not have the expectation to build a long-lasting investment wardrobe, in part because Gen Z came of age well after fast fashion had already completely taken over the clothing industry. It was always the norm for Gen Z to have much more access to fast fashion retailers than any kind of heritage brand, and even some of the more luxury brands they may have shopped at have seen the quality of their production and materials decrease dramatically in the time that Gen Z has been buying clothes. Side note, we actually have a whole chapter on Shein and our cultural obsession with cheapness in our new book, Beyond Getting By, so be sure to pre-order it. Something that contributes to consumerism is that people get up on the hamster wheel about what they think consumption should be or what they think style should be. And I was definitely raised in a house where I had relatives that did not grow up very wealthy. So when I was growing up, it was like, get as much as you can, get it if it's on sale, because that's a good deal, because if we can get more, that's good, because more is good. And that plagued my shopping habits. And then that incentivizes you to glamorize things like hauls or think like that value system that might lead somebody with a lot of money to buy Shein because they might have a value system that's like more is better. Even if my money is not going to something that is a cause that I stand behind, the priority value is let me have more things in life. And so if I can get things for cheaper, that means that I can have more. I also feel like it becomes crippling to people where it's like you're in a certain environment and circumstance, you feel good about being able to treat yourself to a $50 Nadam cashmere sweater or what have you. And then you also might see people on TikTok being like, well, that cashmere is actually not well-made and that's not this, and this is not correct because of that. And I feel like it could be true, but it's difficult for people to conceptualize that. And I feel like it breeds dissatisfaction as well, because then even from the lens of attempting to be ethical, people are constantly trying to seek the better thing or trying to optimize, which I also think is a huge issue towards overconsumption, like optimization in the name of being ethical or getting the right thing. I also think backwardsly or reversely drives consumption. And so I think people are also just exhausted by like choice paralysis and options and trying to pick the best thing instead of being satisfied with the thing that you have. Ultimately, Shein has mastered reaching Gen Zers where they are. They have been dominating TikTok feeds for years, and they're feeding into a need to overconsume that already existed. Shein's daily drops, for example, are a great way to exploit and perpetuate the always-on shopping habits of Zoomers. Quote, 32% of Gen Z consumers shop online at least once a day, and 43% start product searches on TikTok. And we'll dive into that at length in a later section of this video. Essentially, Shein and other fast fashion retailers capitalize on this desire to get 
the biggest bang for your buck. But as we've discussed many times on this channel, the cheapest option usually isn't the best or even really the cheapest long-term when you consider cost per use. But speaking of wildly misunderstood financial advice in Gen Z, chapter four, the scourge of spending on experiences. In the great pantheon of misunderstood financial advice, perhaps, my God, what are you doing? Mona, stop it. You gotta stop though. In the great pantheon of misunderstood financial advice, perhaps no one single mantra has been used and abused more than spend on experiences, not things. So millennials undeniably kicked off the trend of preferring to spend on experiences like concerts, travel, restaurants, over things like a handbag. And there was always the underlying message, sometimes made very explicit, that this was the right thing to do from at minimum a mental health perspective. But as this trend has expanded even further with Gen Z, they're now reporting even higher numbers of preferring to spend on experiences than say do things like save for retirement. It's more important than ever to note that while yes, spending on experiences is likely to bring more long-term satisfaction than say buying another belt when you already have dozens, that does not mean that all spending on experiences is inherently a good thing or even created equal. Okay, so this is me in debt. Oh, this is me in debt. According to 2021 ABS data, 8.7% of millennials actually took out a personal loan to travel. First class, uh, I wasn't considering it, but you know what? Yeah, just put me on first class. I spent like 10K going to Europe. Oh. Yeah, for five weeks. And I know that it's not going to make me look good, but I honestly do not regret that for a second. We got into about 60K of debt after six months of traveling in an RV full time. Now, not only is it incredibly dangerous to put yourself into, for example, credit card debt in order to go to a fourth consecutive bachelorette weekend in Nashville, this perception of experiences being the correct way to spend your money very quickly dilutes what even constitutes a real experience. Experience. For me personally, at the time of filming this video, I am embarking on a month long challenge where I am doing no restaurants, takeout, delivery, pre made meals, etc. In part because I think I'd gotten to a place where I was overdoing these things and they were simply not having the same effect as they used to. But point being, I'm doing this challenge because although I'll always love a nice restaurant or takeout moment, the overindulgence of these things, which is very easy to do in a big city, has made it so that the actual joy and appreciation that I get out of these moments is greatly diminished. Like any other thing that gives you a burst of dopamine, you can quickly build up a tolerance. I think that we are reticent to assess our own consumer behaviors and admit that we spend time thinking about that because it gives people the idea that we're obsessed with consumerism and that you have a problem. And I think that it would actually, our, our pattern of kind of pushing and tamping down fashion and interior and aesthetic interests as either silly and frivolous or is something that means you're obsessed with, with consumerism, I think has been harming us because all of us understand and assess relationships with things like food, you know, interpersonal relationships, romantic relationships, especially as we enter adulthood and this Gen Z age that my age group would be in right now, where you're kind of transitioning into like more proper adulthood. A lot of us will revisit stories from when we were growing up about you know, what is my relationship with food? What are things I was taught about food? What are things I was taught about romantic relationships? And we don't do that with clothing and our consumption because we just don't think of it as something that's like important to do. Or maybe if you do that, people are like, oh, do you have a shopping problem? Like, why are you thinking about that? But I mean, generationally, generationally, we just didn't have relatives before because in the grand scheme of things, this pace of consumption is relatively new after you know, we start producing plastic bags and whatnot in the 50s and TV dinners, and then we're able to pump out clothes once a week. I don't think that we've caught up to that being something that we need to reflect on. And so I think we have this hyper acquisition pace because we haven't even thought of it as something that actually needs to be assessed and worked on the way that we might assess our relationship with our health or romantic relationships. But as it pertains to Gen Z, when you combine the three-headed monster of social media envy, instant shopping, and the meme of you'll get that money back, but you'll never be 22 in this exploitative tourist trap in the Maldives again, 
you get a situation where not only are we upside down on spending priorities, we're also worsening the very real problems of overconsumption. Also, Source very much needed on the idea that you'll just get the money back that you spend away on really expensive travel. Like, ask the amount of people who are in credit card debt specifically on their travel cards. When, like, Airbnb started getting popular, I was like, well, what's the point in me booking an Airbnb that's not, like, an extremely cool house that I'm going to be staying in or like a really cool like location. Like what's the point? I would just stay in a hotel. So I really looked at that as like the whole experience. And I absolutely was like fine with spending money on travel versus like buying clothes. I, I wasn't ever necessarily like buy clothes, buy jewelry. I, it was skincare and travel that were my like big expenses really. Um, So I think I just kind of like allowed myself to do that. Cause I was like, well, like, this is going to be a great trip. Like, yeah, sure, the Airbnb was $2,000. But, I mean, you're seeing all of these trips from, like, influencers and brands that, like, I mean, a lot of them are gifted, which is typically disclosed in the in the content. But that doesn't, like, settle with us mentally in the same way as if we just, like, weren't seeing the content. It's still like, oh, I want that. Like, I want to go on a trip that looks like that. And it's like, I can't afford it. They are, are also not paying for it. So it's it's this interesting um, thing that is happening on social. But I also know with like travel credit cards and whatnot, like it just becomes this, okay, I'll put everything on the credit card, then I can better budget for the trip. So I know exactly what I spent on this trip. Like you kind of rationalize yourself into putting it on a credit card. Um, there are okay ways to use credit cards, sure. But I think a lot of times it's just like your your balance isn't isn't ever completely paid off and then the interest tax on. And um, yeah, so I would say it's a mix. I think all a lot of the big creators who are going on these free trips actually can afford them because they're making so much money from <laughs> from TikTok. But again, like they're not like paying for the trip. So I don't know. It's interesting. But perhaps an even bigger issue around this overspending on experiences isn't just the cost at which it comes to us as individuals, but the cost that it comes to the world around us. Here are just a few fun facts about some of our favorite experiences. Quote, according to the National Restaurant Association, restaurants generate an estimated 22 to 33 billion pounds of food waste annually in the United States. Modern restaurant management reports that the restaurant sector produces 915,400 tons of food waste every single year. For festivals, which have never really been my thing, but I know are quite popular, quote, according to the Greener Festival Report, which analyzed data from events held in 17 countries, the average festival produces 500 tons of carbon dioxide emissions, the weight of three single story houses. On average, up to 80% of visitors leave their tents at festivals in Great Britain. At German festivals, it's estimated at around 30%. The trouble is that tents are almost impossible to recycle given their complex mix of different materials. And for that Instagram-worthy travel, quote, while Positano has 4,000 residents, an average of 12,000 tourists visit every day between Easter and October. And as someone who's been to Positano in the peak of tourist season, I don't know what was wrong with me doing that, I can confirm that the experience of being in a place where tourists so greatly outnumber the locals is, at best, not very pleasant. And it can't be overstated just how much this spend on experiences circle of the Venn diagram is merging with the convenience at all costs circle, especially for Gen Z. For example, Gen Z are most likely to discover new restaurants through social media than any other generation, no real surprise, but they're also more aggressively increasing their use of delivery apps to try the restaurants out. And there could be a whole separate video on the exploitative labor of these apps from a labor, sustainability, and restaurant industry perspective. And we'll probably be diving deep into it in an upcoming video about the gig economy, but it's also important to reiterate the cost from a personal perspective. While there are obviously some benefits to doing things like eating in restaurants or ordering delivery in terms of time and energy, what's undeniable is that it's almost always the worst option in terms of cost. And the huge premium you're paying per meal is something that only increases exponentially. And you can ask basically anyone who's ever ordered overpriced delivery food or gone out to a mediocre restaurant they saw once on Instagram. The buyer's remorse around food spending can be extremely real, especially when you factor in the exorbitant markups. 
Basically, whether it's visiting an already heavily over-touristed destination you saw on Instagram, or waiting in line multiple hours for a bagel that's gone viral, something that is currently happening in my neighborhood and I am completely baffled by every time I walk past it, or hitting multiple festivals in a single summer and leaving your tent behind every time, younger generations are in a hyper-normalization of experience spending that conflates what we see everyone else doing with what is actually of value to us. And what matters is quality, people you actually love, food that's actually good, destinations you can actually appreciate. But the ubiquity of social media awareness and the insistence that all experience spending is worth it have made for an upside down where no one knows what even constitutes an experience anymore. And you might be thinking to yourself, well, so much of that stuff is so expensive. How is the average person even participating in this experience-driven lifestyle? Now, obviously credit card abuse is part of it, but one underrated phenomenon impacting Gen Z, whether it's buying a plane ticket to a trip they shouldn't be taking or a new dress they can't afford is chapter five, the buy now, pay later phenomenon. Buy now, pay later apps and services like Klarna and Affirm have become hugely popular in recent years. Quote, with buy now, pay later, you can make a purchase at a participating retailer and opt for buy now, pay later at checkout. If approved, you make a small down payment, such as 25% of the overall purchase amount. You then pay off the remaining amount in a series of interest-free installments, usually over a few weeks or months. Buy now, pay later apps usually don't charge you interest or fees, and they have a fixed repayment schedule. You know your payment amounts up front, and each payment will be the same. And the number of these loans is staggering. Quote, a September 2022 report from the CFPB found that from 2019 to 2021, the number of buy now, pay later loans originated in the U.S. by the five lenders it surveyed grew from 16.8 million to 180 million. Now, you might be saying to yourself, well, no interest or fees sounds great, but the real problems come when people can't make their payments. Per Investopedia, the cons of these programs are payments can be hard to track, missing or late payments result in late fees and may damage your credit score, no rewards or cash back are earned on purchases, payments may continue even if the item is returned, and plenty more. And we've linked that whole article in the description if you want to read more. Most people who use buy now, pay later loans, because uh, they are loans, don't have a credit card. And the total value of buy now, pay later loans originating in the United States uh, grew by a thousand percent from 2019 to 2021. And so what we're seeing in effect is people opt into layaway style debt rather than like traditional, traditional credit card debt. And what's so interesting to me about this is that cre the use of a credit card, right, comes with the obvious benefit of you building credit, you're building towards something, and that will make getting an apartment, getting a home, getting loans, a variety of other sort of downstream financial um, outcomes much easier for you. But, and there hasn't been much empirical work on this, so again, I'm sort of speculating, what I think the big appeal of the buy now, pay later system is, and what some really high quality journalism is suggesting uh, that, the, that the benefit is, is its flexibility. If you, or its perceived flexibility. Now, while financing for certain purchases like furniture has long been an option, these services that allow you to finance almost literally anything are so new that there's not really that much data on them. So we conducted an informal poll in TFD's Instagram stories to see what the deal looks like for you guys. Out of about 4,000 responses, 11% say they have used a buy now, pay later service to pay for something that they couldn't afford outright, and 5% say that they have been unable to meet the payment schedule after purchasing something via buy now, pay later. Now keep in mind that this is a poll of people who follow a personal finance account on their own accord, so they're already likely more financially prudent than the average, but still. Interestingly, when asked if using one of these services was a good financial decision, a lot of our followers said yes. However, almost all of these were people who wanted to take advantage of 0% interest financing a big purchase, such as a Peloton or a mattress, with the reasoning that these services can make it easier to budget for the item and still get it when you need it. The people who did not think it was a good decision were usually using it to buy clothes and things that they admitted they didn't need. Here were just a few responses. 
As a casual worker, I couldn't afford repayments some weeks. No, because between the ages of 18 to 22, everything went on it as I wasn't educated. No, I have a spending problem, sobbing emoji. It provided relief to me in the moment, but maybe encouraged a bad habit. I almost always regret it. It's like stealing from my future self. Honestly, I wish it was never invented. As a student, I didn't fully understand it and I'm now 5K in debt. It gets you into a cycle of immediate gratification. The interest rates nearly killed me. It was unwise. Now the overall takeaway is if you know what you're getting into and you have a solid plan for repayment, these can be useful programs. But realistically, many people use them because it is an easy and convenient way to buy well past what they can realistically afford or what they need. And the normalization of paying for everything in installments and not actually having to reconcile what you're buying with what you can afford is an incredibly dangerous precedent, especially when, as we'll discuss very soon, so much of shopping and being advertised to is happening before you even realize it. And if you finance everything you buy, even if you initially don't pay any interest, you can easily get stuck in the cycle of bill payoff, never paying for anything up front with the money you actually have. And when you eventually realize you've used up the money you do have to make yet another purchase with financing, that'll probably result in paying exorbitant fees and interests. Trying to figure out what actually matters to you as far as like what you should be spending money on. Cause I think I was so like, whatever, like I'll buy this or I'll buy this. And I just never really thought much about my spending and what I actually cared about. And I wasn't intentional like at all with what I was spending. Um, so that played a big role. And also just like understanding that you're paying at least 30% more on, on whatever item you're buying if you're putting it on a credit card, if you're not paying off your balance every single month. Um, and then you're stuck with so much interest. I like looked at my credit card interest from last year and it was like well over $5,000. And I was like, <laughs> like that's an extra $5,000 that could have been like money that I had. Um, but instead it just went to the credit card company. So I think you got to start somewhere is what I always tell people. Like, I think people get really overwhelmed with debt and finances. I mean, for good reason, it's overwhelming and confusing, but like start somewhere and figure out something that like works for you as far as like debt payoff goes. But as I mentioned, probably one of the most insidious aspects of how easy it's become to buy basically everything is how aggressively basically everything is being marketed to us, especially to young people. Which brings us to our final chapter, TikTok, the resuscitated corpse of QVC. If you've been on TikTok lately, you may have noticed just how glossy a lot of the content is becoming. Creators who used to talk about their average everyday lives are now suddenly product pitch people. I was so obsessed as a teenager with YouTube. And so I would watch these YouTubers um, and what products they use. And I was so focused on getting the like perfect formula of what I needed to like have the perfect skin or have the most like aesthetic like apartment and whatnot. So I think it really started uh, pretty early for me as far as like the content that I was consuming and TikTok, I think, I mean, you have these TikTok personalities who people follow every single day, which is really fun. Like I, I like the app. I think the app is great, but the same thing happens where you're like, okay, if this person is like wearing this or if this person buys this or whatnot, like now I want to buy it because I love this person. Um, so I think there's like a lot of things psychologically at play that are affecting the overconsumption on TikTok. I thankfully have never fallen victim to buying something on, on TikTok shop, but it's like every other video is like, buy something, buy something. And now even when you go on someone's page and scroll through their page, like there's ad breaks in that <laughs> on their page that aren't even like their own ads or like their own videos. So it's like just constantly inundated with, with things to buy. And this is not an accident. The effect of a product's TikTok specific popularity on its sales is so well established with the platform making everything from fantasy books to hair tools to questionable pink condiments into overnight phenomena, that it was only a matter of time before the creators and the app itself started getting in on bigger and bigger cuts of the deal. Now this is bad from the actual enjoying the videos part of the experience, of course, but it's particularly insidious financially when you consider just how aggressively Gen Z is using the app to make a lot of their decisions. By some current estimates, a record 76% of the entire generation reports being on TikTok. So like it or not, what gets shown on that platform is getting normalized for Gen Z. And now it's not just about body envy 
or sometimes bad advice. It's about fundamentally changing the way we consume and blurring the line between reality or entertainment and advertisements in a historically and legally unprecedented way. In fact, even in just the past few weeks, you may have noticed serious changes as you're mindlessly scrolling TikTok because they're currently pioneering unprecedented ways to turn into a place where you don't just scroll for content, but you do your Sunday shopping. They're currently beta testing an update to the app, which would make any video instantly shoppable when a product is shown or mentioned. Quote, a TikTok spokesperson confirmed to Bloomberg that the feature is in early testing. Under the new system, objects in a user's videos are scanned and identified, and viewers are prompted to buy them or similar items in the TikTok shop. And for those who may not have the context, TikTok Shop is an in-app platform for products to be bought and sold. So basically creators are now all just shopkeeps on the Oregon Trail, regaling you with their tales as they direct you to their various goods and sundries. And if you haven't noticed any of these changes, feel lucky because users are reporting en masse just how much it is destructive to the actual app experience. And if shopping in the app itself wasn't enough, creators are also incentivized to list things on something called an Amazon storefront. As one article put it, quote, an Amazon storefront is basically your own custom branded website on Amazon that allows registered brands to showcase their products without any distractions from competitors, products, or ads. It'll have the look and feel of a real e-commerce store with Amazon's huge audience reach. Everything's like less than $30 and on Prime and it came in two days. Now, anytime a user mentions a product that they enjoy or mentions a product at all, really, they can direct their audience to go buy that same item from their dedicated storefront, where they take a cut from each product sold. On top of all of that, you have a lot of content that is actually in and of itself an ad, products that have been gifted or where a creator receives a cut of profits or where they're being outright paid to endorse it. And yet the protocols for proper disclosure are often not even close to being followed. And part of the problem is just how much regulators have struggled to keep up with these changing platforms. It's incredibly difficult to create new rules for proper ad disclosure when the type of content you're monitoring changes every few months with updates, or the platforms themselves didn't even exist a few years ago. But it's also because of our general normalization of spawn con culture, especially amongst young people who grew up on social media. The consumerism on TikTok it is like an ad platform now, which like it makes sense that they're like taking an companies are taking advantage of of using ads on TikTok but it's like to what end like TikTok used to be so different like in the in the beginning of like the pandemic like it was really just like silly dances and whatever like whatever I don't know and then now it just feels very like how do I monetize this like thing and it's like oh my god even like there is so many content like so much content on like how to go viral, how to grow your following and how to do this. And it's like, you have this constant to-do list as a, a teenager, I'm assuming for like people who are on TikTok. It's like, how do I get famous? It's, it's psychologically a lot. <laughs> For a lot of users, especially younger ones who are native to these platforms, the idea of seeing a creator ostensibly showing their real life, while everything from the clothes they're wearing on vacation, to the hotel they're staying in, to the camera they're filming with, have been gifted or comped, is pretty normal. These lines are very easy to blur, and the cumulative effect is a digital world where young people are almost always being sold something, but it's never totally clear what or who exactly benefits when they click buy. Ultimately, Gen Z is not in a totally unique situation. All of these economic and social problems they're dealing with that we've discussed are things that affect all generations and are probably only going to get more extreme with time. But when you combine it with the limitations they're facing in terms of earning potential, the lingering effects of the pandemic and recession, the unprecedented debt they're paying off, and how heavily they're marketed to, it's not surprising that increasingly Gen Z doesn't even see long-term wealth building like retirement or home ownership as even an option. The the concept of ownership itself is becoming more and more fleeting as the products they're being offered are not built to last even a year, let alone a lifetime. But as their future prospects diminish, they're more and more aggressively marketed with all kinds of convenience they don't need. One really fascinating thing that we found while researching this video is that marketing executives routinely position Gen Zers as a strong market to advertise to. Amazon published a blog post geared towards storefronts claiming, quote, Gen Z has money to spend. Are you ready? They're viewed as ideal customers, but I would argue that it's because they have been conditioned to spend whenever possible, not because they hold more wealth than older generations. We also can't deny that Gen Zers are lucid about the world around them. They know what their future probably looks like in the face of the climate crisis and the great wealth 
disparity. And while some will likely choose to deal with this existential despair with defeatism and YOLO spending culture, many others are turning to activism and pushing for positive change, starting grassroots organizations like the Sunrise Movement and taking part in unionizing efforts. And many likely subscribe a little to both camps. The thing that's really apparent right now about Gen Z and Gen Alpha appears to be in about the same boat is this real sense of cynicism about institutions. So a real lack in of trust in the courts, in Congress, in the presidency, um, in the laws that we have, and in the people tasked with enforcing them. And sort of given those beliefs, what we might expect is either a galvanizing effect, right, where people rise up and they really participate and they really educate themselves. Um, but what we might also see is sort of a depressive effect. Everything's bad, everything's broken, nothing changes. Why bother? Um, I think the jury's still out on what we'll see with Gen Z in specific, but I don't know that the data give us reason to be optimistic right now, given the the deep level of institutional trust and the and the sort of cynicism. Um, but I don't think that's yet cause for despair because these attitudes can change. Millennials were berated for years about our love of avocado toast and our dislike for having children. It's not unusual for each new generation to receive tons of criticism about how they move through the world and their lack of seriousness when it comes to embracing adulthood. But I'm not interested in beating up on Gen Z, not only because I think intergenerational fighting is deeply unchic, but also because I totally understand where some of these on the surface not great financial decisions are coming from. We're increasingly presenting young people with a no-win situation. And while some change can be made on the individual level, and we always advocate for smarter decision making, if we want Gen Z to make better choices financially, we have to give them better options to choose from. As always, guys, thank you for watching, and I'll see you back here next month for our March video essay. Goodbye!